Hello everybody, I'm doing this presentation in uh, response to a bunch of people that wanted uh, some species of review for the second test. And so here we go. Now I've been done reviews before and I expect to keep this very slow, or I'm sorry, very fast, not very slow, very fast. Let me start by saying you guys, if you have not watched the presentations, the online presentations, if you have not watched those, close this immediately and go watch those first. This is not any sort of guide to watching the presentations. It's not. So if you haven't watched the presentation, the one I'm going to put out here doesn't make any sense at all. Please drop what you're doing, close this out, and go watch the presentations first. So with that in mind, let me talk uh, first about the test format. The test format has not changed from the first test. Uh, you'll get 20 multiple choice questions. Uh, you'll have a limited time to do that. Uh, based on the results of the first test, I've already seen that. Um, for most of you, that's more than enough time. If you had technological problems on the first test, solve them before you do the second test, please. Thank you. So you'll be presented with four, quite possibly five essays. Five essays is actually 20% better for you. Again, uh, consider a quick outline. You'll get the prompt. You'll have plenty of time to do an essay. I'm expecting at least three pages. Please do that single space. Don't come up with some crazy font size. But your uh, instructions are, tell me everything you know on the topic that you select. So intro paragraph, tell me what you're going to tell me. Be direct. I'm looking for a thesis statement at least. And then just some sort of like a quick little sentence saying, I'm going to talk about this, that, the other, and the third thing or the fourth thing. That's what I'm going to do. So uh, then three to 50 body paragraphs, not a typo. Tell me everything you know on the topic that you select. Keep going. The more thorough you are, the more material you provide, the better your grade will be. Because you have so much time to like prepare your, uh, your um, uh, response to the essay, listen, then the standards are really, really super high. Then give me a conclusion. That's what you're supposed to do in any essay. Tell me what you're going to tell me, tell me, and then tell me what you told me. Restate the thesis I have on there. Make certain that you fully answer the question. Strong note here, just a mental note now. The prompt is exactly that. In other words, if you do exactly what the prompt says and then stop, you didn't do enough. The prompt is just to sort of give you a broad guideline. One, what you want to do to get a good grade in this test is to overwhelm me with information. Keep going. That is always going to be my advice to you on the test. Keep going. More is better. It's quality over quantity. If you, you know, if, if you're just trying to BS me, well, you know, I, I don't know. I was in the Army for a long time. I know a BS when I see it. And so don't do that. Uh, I'm not interested in, you know, clouds are fluffy and fire is hot and you know, water is wet and stuff like that. Facts and analysis, that's what I want. So you are not graded on structure or grammar, only content. Now, having said that, please understand, ladies and gentlemen, again, it's quality over quantity. But try to avoid comma slices, splices. Try to avoid those. Try to avoid uh, tense shifts. Try to avoid, you know, basic errors in grammar. Try to avoid that. But I'm only looking really for facts and analysis. What are the facts in the case? And what do the facts mean? That's what I want to know. All right. So with that in mind, let's kind of, let's, let's get on with the review. Let's get on with it. Now, again, if you haven't watched the uh, presentations online, stop what you're doing right now and go watch them. All right, so the first thing we talked about uh, when we came back off the first test is the American War of Independence. So we're picking up right where the first test left off. The last thing that should be in your notes before the American War of Independence is the course of acts. And so pick up right there. Uh, I talked about Lexington Concord. And I talked about Bunker Hill, Breeds Hill. Then I gave you the Declaration of Independence. We talked about the First Continental Congress a little bit. Then I started kind of a pattern in the way I presented the information. I gave you some big giant battle, and then we talked about other things. And then I gave you a big giant battle, and then I gave you other things. 
So if you see a test question on the American War of Independence, you need to be prepared. Listen to me. You need to be prepared to take one of those phases of the war. Give me some great big giant battle and then tell me what the results were. So phase one, the end of phase one, was the Battle of Saratoga. Okay, and the results of that was, you know, it brought the French in. Well, what did the French bring? Uh, our big idea there is that the, we could not have won the American War of Independence without the French. So be prepared to talk, for example, about the Battle of Saratoga, the background, the outcome of the battle, who were the major players. Then sort of switch gears and talk about the French coming in. What did they bring? And I spent probably an hour just on that one slide. So if you haven't seen it, go back and take a look at it. Uh, the second phase, uh, there were two parts to that, the war on land and then the war at sea. On the war on land, we talked about George Roger Clark. He grabbed three forts way out there on the frontier. And so what were the consequences of that? And be prepared to answer that question. Then we talked about the war at sea, and that was itself divided up into two parts. The privateers, also known as letters of market reprisal, or the efforts of the regular United States Navy. And I gave you a bunch of examples of that. And I, I said, now the, the real result of this is, and I'll just tell you right here as a reminder, that made Great Britain want to end the war. And that's the biggest of the big deals. Then I talked about the Battle of Yorktown. And it was the end of this Yorktown campaign. It was Cornwallis. He lands in the south. He thinks that there's a whole bunch of uh, loyalists down there in the south. That's not true. It was one-third, 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 but that was in every town and village and every locality. It was not regional. So he won some battles and lost some battles, but he wound up at Yorktown. Okay, so what was the outcome of that? Well, Yorktown, uh, Washington and Rochambeau went down there, and they beat Cornwallis at Yorktown. So the consequences were the Treaty of Paris, 1783, and be prepared to talk about that. What were the particulars of it? Why did it take so long to get to the treaty? Uh, who did what? What, were the, what was the real outcome of that? So be prepared to talk about, uh, in an essay question, any one of the phases of the war. Pick a phase, phase one, phase two, phase three, there it all is, and tell me everything you know about that. What are the facts? What is the analysis? So with that in mind, let's move on to the next major issue that we discussed. Now, I talked for a long time about the early republic. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this does not really lend itself, because of the chaotic nature of it, it doesn't really uh, lend itself to an essay question. But all of the major issues that are involved do lend themselves in a big way towards multiple choice questions. So I talked about the Treaty of Paris, and I talked about that on the previous slide. Uh, then I talked about the Orders of Confederation and Government, and I talked about that on the previous presentation. Then Shades Rebellion. What are the facts and the outcome of that? Then the money, the Northwest Ordinance. Now, the Northwest Ordinance, the Shades Rebellion, those could rise to the level of a multiple choice question. Uh, Shades Rebellion showed conclusively that the federal government could not rise to the security needs of the people. They couldn't do that. The states had a problem. Massachusetts had a problem, and they couldn't end it, so they had to negotiate, and that's bad. Uh, the Northwest Ordinance provided a mechanism for new states to enter the Union. Remember, it's 30,000 voters to become a territory. Then it's 60,000 voters to become a state. And a voter is a white male landowner back in those days. That definition will change later. But that's the way it was in 1787 with the Northwest Ordinance. Then the Constitutional Convention, there might be a little something on the Constitution. There will not be an essay question that deals with the Constitution. Yeah, I think I heard a big sigh of relief on that. Okay, that's fine. Because I don't expect you guys to know it the way I have to know it. I have to know it really, really well because of what I do, my profession. But I don't expect you guys to know it that way. But you do need to know some of the basics. Then uh, I talked about the early presidents, Washington, Adams, Jefferson, and Madison, and, and in Jackson. We skipped on to Jackson. And be prepared to answer a question or two about them on the multiple choice uh, question, on the multiple choice portion. I also talked in the early republic about the Alien Sedition Act, the Kentucky-Virginia Resolutions. Be familiar, familiar with those. Louisiana Purchase and Take Em Kay's Rebellion. Be familiar with all that. Okay. So that was the early republic. Again, it's just so uh, topsy-turvy, it's just so chaotic that it really doesn't lend itself to an essay question. 
but the multiple choice questions, wow, you can expect quite a bit from this era. Let's move on. Now, I did talk about three Supreme Court cases. Listen to me carefully, please. It could be that you find an essay question that says, we talked about three major Supreme Court cases. Pick one and tell me everything you know about it. Now, as I went through every one of these cases, I gave you a basic outline. What was the background? What was the plaintiff for the defendant side? What is the outcome? And what does it mean to American history? So I talked about Marbury versus Madison. I must have given you an hour and a half presentation just on that. Same thing with McCullough versus Maryland. The presentation did not last so long because the case itself was very direct. Worcester versus Georgia, an extremely complex case. But please understand, ladies and gentlemen, all of these cases are very, very complex. And all I gave you was a thumbnail sketch. You have just the extreme basics. So if it turns out that you see a question on this and you choose to answer it, you must do outside resource research. Stay away from Wikipedia. Do not use Wikipedia. Wikipedia is off limits. If you use Wikipedia, I will know it because I know what they say on there and I know that there's some very serious errors on it. So feel free to go to a .gov, as in SCOTUS.gov, Supreme Court of the United States, SCOTUS.gov, and it has these cases. It certainly has uh, Marshall's uh, judgments on the case. It has his notes on the case. Or go to a .law or a .edu. There's plenty out there. Do a, a quick Google search. It could give you a lot of, like, a good resources, but stay away from Wikipedia. Anyway, it could be that these rise to the level of an essay question. Choose one and tell me everything you know about it. Now, because I'm kind of revealing this to you, if you see a question on this, you choose to answer it. Understand it can't be skeletal. You've got to like write a thorough, clear, and unambiguous essay on this. The standards are very, very high on this. All right. So there you have it. If you haven't seen uh, the presentations, go back and take a look at them. Antebellum slavery. What was the South case? That is your um, thesis statement. Now, antebellum slavery is part of Jacksonian on the online portion. You'll see it's a, a, a Jacksonian. I think it's part one Jacksonian. Uh, Jacksonian is part one, part two, part three, and this is part one. Now, again, uh, what was the South case? Let's get into this. You have to make an economic and a sociological argument. You can't make a moral argument. Slavery is bad. I know. I agree with that. I'm a fiery abolitionist. But take a look at the master, the relationship between the master and the owner. Take a look at uh, rebellions. What do they mean? What are the interpretations? Teamwork versus re resistance. Education. Describe all that. Uh, I talked about uh, comparing uh, African Americans, slaves at that time, uh, to the master. That's probably not a good um, interpretation of what's going on. Compare them to poor whites. There are many, many, many more poor whites than there were slave owners, as it turns out. And so compare it that way. That's a better comparison, a more meaningful comparison. Uh, what do I gave you guys a whole bunch of information on what uh, we know about uh, the, the skill sets that slaves had. And I, I went over that in, in, excru in excruciating uh, documented detail. We talked about that. So slave labor in the broader economy, uh, take a look at uh, what's going on with the pie chart, with the statistics, with the density of the slave population and their location. Uh, urban uh, slaves versus rural slaves, take a look at that. Then I talked uh, a lot about Harry Beecher Stowe's version. Now listen to me carefully. Do not do an essay that talks about a comparison between the southern labor force and the northern labor force. That's off limits. You don't have the time for that. If you see a question on antebellum slavery, stick to that. But please understand how the North viewed slavery. You can talk about that, how the North viewed slavery. That may, in fact, be part of an essay. Talk about how the North viewed slavery. Was it accurate or inaccurate? Was it agenda-driven? You know, you can talk about that. But it could be that there's an essay that talks about uh, the labor system of the North. More about that right about now. Uh, then I talked about the economic growth of uh, the North in the age of Jackson. And I think this is um, 
uh, the presentation, I think it's um, Mark two, it's a part two of three. And I talked about what's going on in the economy of the North, whaling, uh, canal building, clipper ships, railroads, tactiles. I talked about the issue behind the issue. What was the issue behind the issue? Uh, all these people were making money. And what did they do with the money that they made? And they spent it. So what's going on with the economy? And all the other things that were going on in the economy were happening all at the same time, really that first industrial revolution, 18-teens, really to the 1830s, 1840s. So what was the problem? The law not caught up with industrialization. And that means that we can do this on the backs of human beings, children in the workforce. And what does that mean? Uh, abusing women in the workforce. And what does that mean? And, and all these abuses that are taking place, what, you know, what's going on there? Did people understand what was going on at the time? So again, any part of this might rise to the level of a multiple choice part. But it could rise to the level of an essay question as well. Now, bear in mind that you're not allowed to take what's going on in the North and then compare it to slavery in the South. Do not, do not do that. You don't have time in the essay to make a comparison between the Northern uh, workforce and the Southern workforce. There are two different workforces in the same country at the same time. Well, no wonder we had a civil war later on, but that's a separate issue here. Take a look at uh, the labor force, the economy of the North in camera. That uh, is to say, as a standalone issue. Last but not least, I'm pretty sure this is part three of three, Jacksonian part three of part three of three on the online material, Western Migration, Manifest Destiny. What is our definition of manifest destiny? That could rise to the level of a multiple choice question easily. That sounds like a simple multiple choice question to me. Then what's the pattern of migration? Who goes to the West first? And then examples of that. Then uh, I gave you context. Uh, the Northwest Ordinance, Louisiana Purchase, Indian Removal. Be prepared to talk about that. Then I talked about Texas Independence of the Mexican War, 1847, 1848. And then I ended with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hildago. So strong, you know, strong thought here. Not strong, no, but strong thought. It could be, I have no idea about this, but it could be that you're faced with a question that says, basically, grow America. And so you need to do, you need to take all the issues that have to do with the growth of the United States and put them together in one place. And that will start with the Northwest Ordinance and be prepared to talk about that. That is a mechanism to bring new states into the union. Then actually put that into practical application. Uh, the Louisiana Purchase. Then into removal. Got to deal with the Native Americans. And then uh, get Texas involved in this and bring Texas in. And then uh, you might be able to mention um, the Missouri Compromise of 1821. And that's kind of this limitation, but it like really motivates the South to want to grow America. Then get to the Mexican War of 1847 to 1848. And then the Treaty of Guadalupe Hildago in 1848, we achieved Manifest Destiny. So if you see a question on Western Migration and Manifest Destiny, be prepared to like go back through all of your notes and put everything that has to do with Manifest Destiny in one place and then approach that as a single essay. Northwest Ordinance, Louisiana Purchase, you know, don't get bogged down in the Lewis and Clark expedition, the Corps of Discovery, any more than you would uh, Zebulon Pike and his adventures or um, any of these other uh, early explorers. Just don't get bogged down in that. Don't get bogged down in storytelling. What are the facts? What are the analysis? And so, grow America from basically coast to coast. All right. So, uh, that should give you a brief overview of everything that we talked about Um uh, beginning with the American War of Independence and ending with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848. Uh, just, uh, you know, knock this test out of the out of the ballpark. Get, get after it. But let me close by reminding you one last time. None of this is the, the course material itself. It's only an overview, and that's all it was meant to be. If you have not watched the material, don't use this to go back and guide your viewing. You have to watch it all because multiple choice questions are going to emerge from every bit of it, from the entire part of this, this block of instruction. So if you haven't watched uh, the online material, go back and watch it. And good luck on the test. I will see you guys when I see you.